What's going on everyone? Adam here and this is the host of Cool Place with the Cool People. We are all the way out in Downing today because no other <laughs> divorce lawyer wanted to call me back or email me back or text me back or DM me back. And we are so lucky to be in an office today. First off, I will say this place is amazing. I really wish we had cool offices like out here. It almost makes me want to move closer to the beach. And then I realized like, eh, the traffic's too bad. So I don't know if I'm and I just want to thank you so much for having us in your office today and uh, us be able to enlighten our, our people, um, what, what, why you became a lawyer, what you do, and kind of the benefits that people should be looking for. And, uh, and this is your first podcast. It so, is, it is. So how do you feel on the first podcast ever? Well, it's, you, you took my first joke away because oh. that's the first thing I was going to say. I was going to talk about <laughs> this being my first podcast, but thank you for being here. Of I course, appreciate yeah. it. And thanks for coming all the way out to Downey. Oh, for sure. Uh, for us uh, Downeyites... Uh, uh, we're very proud folk mm -hmm. here in the city of Downey. I've been living here since 1990. I went to a little bit of elementary school mm -hmm. here, middle school and high school. And aside the time when I lived in, in Santa Barbara for undergraduate school, I've always lived in Downey. Oh, nice. Sorry, that's my phone. No, don't right there. be. Listen, we, we actually want to act like we're actually in an office. This isn't a stage, so this happens all the time. I think every time we do a podcast, someone phones rings. So it's, you know what that means? You're just a busy person and people actually want to talk to you. If your phone's not ringing, we got a problem. Perfect. Right? That's why I have two phones, because then people think I'm really important when really one's just for my mom and then the other ones are for clients. So You're taking all my jokes. I was just going to tell my brother, tell mom to stop calling now. Yeah. We oh, got my, the... mom, my mom literally texted her now. She's like, I'm on my way to your apartment to do your laundry. Thanks, mom. I'm moving I'm moving on Monday. I'm like, pack some stuff up. This is this is why I keep her around, to be honest. So so you've been a lawyer for nine years. You have, you've had your own company for three years. What was, the, what was the reasoning on wanting to become a lawyer? I mean, that's not always something that people think of growing up what was it when was that moment you realized hey this is what I want to do uh, it was after I graduated from undergraduate okay. I uh, was a history major and um, I was really starting to get into the law and uh, I had worked a few jobs as an interpreter so I've had some exposures going to court and being around attorneys and I started to little by little fall in love with the profession mm -hmm. I decided to become an interpreter. I was an interpreter for uh, three to four years on a full-time basis. It means I was in court on a daily basis oh, doing man. trials, doing hearings, doing depositions, doing the behind the scenes on, on, on private matters. So I got a nice, really full view of the profession and I fell more and more in love with it. And I thought it was time now to become an attorney. Nice, man. And so do you have, obviously we're here and we're going to shoot some content after this just for divorces because... The, you know, the big thing is me pushing out content for people that my clients need, but like, would you have a type of law that you actually prefer working more than anything else? Well, it is this one, and, and what we call it is, it's a little more broad, we call it family law mm -hmm. in, in, in the California system. And it doesn't just entail uh, divorces, uh, it entails uh, custody issues, support issues, um, division of assets that mm -hmm. we talked before, uh, but you get a really good view into people's lives, into people's world. Actually, it's a privilege. You get to know a lot about other people that in many other professions you don't get a chance and it's a huge responsibility. Uh, from the time that I was an interpreter, I, got an, I had an experience to interpret different types of law mm -hmm. and it was family law that gave the most uh, access to intimacy mm -hmm. to really get into people's lives and, and try to make a difference on day-to-day on -day issues mm -hmm. that affect so many people in California. Um, so I ended up really, really falling in love with this area of practice. Oh, uh, for sure. I think, uh, you know, one of my past clients was a mediator and she would mediate in family court and she said, you know, I was able to change families every single day and she's like, that's why I keep on doing it. So it's, I feel like it's, it's, it's way you can help people and you're infecting people's lives. And if you do a good job, then it's a good thing, you know, come out. I actually do have a question, but I'm going to save it for later because we're just getting started. But I just remember because I had jury duty about a month ago and I have a, I want to have a question with a lawyer that thinks through that. So Adrian, <laughs> remind me to ask that question. So, um, so you, so you did this for nine years or you became, you've been a lawyer for nine years. You then all of a sudden opened your practice after three or the last three years you've had your own practice. Well, was the reason on getting that next step did you feel that you needed to go on your own look simply put it was i wanted to be my own boss okay right and uh and it, it, it stemmed from there um i had an opportunity to pursue partnership with my my prior boss uh but i wanted to be here in downey i wanted to be my own boss um wanted to open up and go my own route wanted mm -hmm. to focus exclusively uh, on family law. Um, while in the last firm I was at, we also dealt with civil matters mm -hmm. and some criminal matters. And I just really wanted to focus my attention 
and my career on family law. Mm -hmm. And so between wanting to be my own boss, wanting to be in Downey and having the focus of my practice in Downey and wanting to concentrate on family law, those were the different uh, different reasons that mm -hmm. took me to open up my own firm and also having enough experience. And after about five years, which is when I left my mm -hmm. prior firm, um, I thought that I had the, the sufficient experience. Do you feel like uh, most people, most lawyers that you come in, in contact with are better off going on their own? So if I'm a consumer looking for a lawyer in your uh, in family law, is it is it more important to go after like a bigger firm, or do you think more of a single a single family uh, family lawyer is better off, or is it just? whoever you connect best with. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you framed it that way. Obviously, I'm going to have a bias Obviously, for that intimacy yes, that you course. get from the solo practitioner. But what you said last is most important mm -hmm. is whether they work for a huge firm um, or they're the principal attorney in a small firm is who you have a good feeling and who you're going to trust. Mm -hmm. Um, if you don't trust that person or you don't have a good feeling with that person, then whether it's someone like me on their own or somebody working for a huge firm downtown, you're not going to feel satisfied. Mm -hmm. Even 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 if the level of representation is good, mm -hmm. objectively good, looked from outside, if you don't have a feeling or a contact with your attorney, you're going to feel empty. You're Do not you going to feel like the representation was what you should have gotten. Do you happen, because this happens in my world, I think we kind of feel like our industries are almost the same. We're always walking into people's homes. We have no idea what's going on. And then we have to figure out, you know, I, I always am very interested when I go into someone's house that I've never met before. Or they just call me or they see something. And then I'm like having to pick process. Okay, like why are they selling? What's the, really the truth? The, and then it comes out later, oh, we're getting a divorce or, you know, we can't make the payments anymore. Um, and sometimes you're working with someone and then all of a sudden they get don't feel like they can trust you or something happens and they go to somewhere else. Do you guys see that happening a lot after you make contact with a client where halfway through or whatever, they all of a sudden feel like, hey, I'm going to go use a different lawyer? It it happens. It It is a common occurrence. It doesn't happen a lot necessarily. Okay. Um, I've been in full disclosure I've been on both ends of that Perfect. situation hey, that you're talking too. about <laughs> listen, listen I always say if you haven't been fired uh, and maybe a little bit of a lawsuit on accident or kind of a thing you're not doing a good enough job exactly. you're not working with enough people exactly exactly and so it does, it does happen I do um I happen to take over more cases than when I'm replaced but mm -hmm. both of them happen and within our family law system it is a fairly straightforward process. It's mm -hmm. just a couple of forms to go from either being self-represented to a, an attorney or for going from attorney A to mm -hmm. attorney B. And then I have no idea, and this is something that I've, I'm asking a lot of questions because I don't even know any answer. It's like, for, in my world, we're not paying until after the thing. How does it work in family law? Are you paying a an up free, uh, you know, a, a retainer fee up front and then, and then, or is it per case or per hour? So the most common way of charging in a family law case, which is the way that I do it, mm -hmm. it's an hourly retainer and you pay up front. Okay. And then it's not a flat fee. Uh, it's based on um, the way I like to ask for a first retainer is an amount that I would charge you where I believe that I can begin, carry through and finish your case in an ideal world, mm -hmm. right? So based on my hourly I ask, and the needs of the client, I ask for a retainer where I think without too much conflict, the case can actually be finalized. Mm -hmm. Now, some things, sometimes things go south and fees go up, mm -hmm. obviously, because obviously. there's more conflict. Um, family law is one of those areas of law where it is very tough to have a contingency type of mm -hmm. uh, plan, which is you get paid at the end based yeah. on the returns because California has a uh, public policy where they wish people to get back together, right? Okay. So if my success is tied to you ultimately being divorced, <laughs> then I'm going against public policy. Therefore, yeah. an hourly retainer or flat fees are preferred. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you're ever being asked to enter into a contingency agreement, you should really think twice um, about analyzing it very closely mm -hmm. to make sure that everything is being done correct. While it is allowed, it is not the preferred method mm -hmm. of payment for an family law or divorce attorney. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm actually, I, I used to never do this. I used to never have like a, a front, upfront fee. Like I would just list the house if it didn't sell or they fired me. I would just like, you know, that's part of the game. I actually started doing that where it's like, hey, listen, this is how much it costs for me to get the house on the market, get started. So if you want to cancel it before our contract's up or something, I, I need to be at least reimbursed. And I finally started doing that this year because I started having, I'm like, dude, I'm working my butt off and I'm not making any money and I'm actually negative money because I'm paying for photos and marketing and stuff. So I started even doing what you guys do, like an upfront 
what does it take for me to just get the house on the market so at least can, I can break even on the back end if something it goes wrong? Well, because nobody takes away the time you spent doing it. Exactly. Right? You, you work that, that amount of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it happens to us a little bit as well, which is someone starts, then policy actually works, which is that they get back together. Mm -hmm. But the work that's been done, it's been done. Exactly. So I, I tend to charge that. Yeah, Yeah. no, for sure. So I see that you have, uh, when we came in, we met your a few assistants. So is that, is that where you really run your company? Is it you and then multiple assistants beneath you? Yeah, that is correct. I have uh, two assistants mm -hmm. right now um, who work almost full time. Um, between the two of them, they're here about 60 to 70 hours. Uh, they're fairly young. Mm -hmm. One of them is... Um, just finished her first semester of law school, so she wants to pursue a career in law, and the other one is thinking about a career in law. Her father happens to be a district attorney. I also have an intern right now who just started uh, last week. She's a student at UCI and is p potentially pursuing a uh, degree in, uh, in law as well. And then I also have my brother who is my office manager mm -hmm. and handles all the finances and getting cool people like yeah, you to sure. come over and do a podcast yeah, in, in my sure. office. He, he's like, I see some guy I can suck her in and doing some media for us, so why not? So, I mean, when me and your brother were talking before, like he, he runs multiple restaurants and stuff like that. I'm assuming that entrepreneur lifestyle is in your blood. Obviously, you're basically running your own company. He's running, he's doing things. What was the reason I'm maybe not going down that route and, not, and going down more law? Well, I'm, I'm more of... I'm more of a book worm, yeah. you know, and so I always envisioned my career to be very intimately tied to a to a profession where I went to school for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it's a lack of creativity. <laughs> I don't know, but uh, yeah, my 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 father was a doctor. Okay, my father is a doctor. There's a lot of doctors in my family. I thought about it until um, pre med got pretty real, mm -hmm. and um, I realized I didn't want to be a doctor. And I thought of either being a, a history professor mm -hmm. or getting into the law. And um, being a history professor would mean spending a lifetime in the library, mm -hmm. uh, which is not exactly what I wanted to do. Yeah. And not too much contact with people, which is what's so great about the law. No, for sure. I think uh, I, I definitely don't know if I could ever spend time in like a, a nine to five or in, a, in like in a cubicle. Like my team calls me a free bird. Like, We'll have days and all of a sudden the day will just go sideways and then some days it's like next thing you know we're doing a podcast here and then a food vlog later and it's just like that freedom to just kind of be my own boss and you know kind of go with the flow of things. That's like Yeah, I'm sure you find it that you can be productive in your profession yes. in more ways than just sitting on the desk and exactly. then that to me is important. It's healthy as well. So how often are you in court per week? Um, Look, I would say some, sometimes you can I go a couple of weeks without a court appearance and other times, for example, next week I'm in court every day, except mm -hmm. for Monday, which is Martin Luther King Day. Uh, but if I were to give you an average two to three times a week, okay. I'm in court. Yeah. Okay. So I do have a question. But So you do family law, so you're, you're more working with judges and mediators, right? Right. Yeah. Um, my... I was in jury duty last week and it's, I don't know, you never did criminal, but like they sent me home first. So I was wondering like, what are the thoughts and processes of sending people home that are on juries, but you're more working with mediators. So. Well, look, I can tell you from my time as an interpreter as well, mm -hmm. uh, because I did a lot of trials as an interpreter. And f if you have an intimate knowledge or what appears to be an intimate knowledge of the law, both, both sides want to get rid of you. <laughs> if it okay. seems you have a profession that's more geared to be antagonistic towards police officers, mm -hmm or have a history that is antagonistic to police officers or men in uniforms, the district attorney, the people that are trying to put the defendant yeah, in jail, yeah. they're going to want to get rid of you, yeah. right? And, and vice versa. If you have a lot of family that are in law enforcement and whatnot, then the defense is going to want to get mm -hmm. rid of you. Uh, luckily for, luckily, <laughs> um, not that I'm trying to get away from my civic duty, but yeah. uh, for attorneys or somebody who's been in a court, they, they almost just... They kick us out of juries. Yeah. They tend to kick yeah. us out of juries. Man, I should have became a lawyer just for that one Just time. for that. That would have been worth it, right? It's that one time, so I wouldn't have to do jury duty. Um, so do you enjoy being in the courtroom? Does that like does that kind of get you all fueled up? Does that get you pumped up to kind of go in and, and, and get the best thing for your client? Or or and, and are you ever working with a husband and wife at the same time? Or is it like they have their attorney and then you're hired by someone else? Okay, so I'll, I'll answer that separately. The first one is I love going to court mm -hmm. and uh, probably one of the reasons why I like family law so mm -hmm. much, it's um, there's a lot of litigation, mm -hmm. right? And so you're in court quite often. Um, 
You're also in front of mediators quite often uh, trying to resolve matters. Uh, and then you're also right, family law is not a jury, uh, it's, not, it's not an area of the law that uses jury. So all decisions are either made by the parents, by agreement, mm -hmm. or by a judge when they can't agree. Um, and I do love, like I told you, I do love litigating. I love going to court. I still get the butterflies, mm -hmm. uh, but it's nice to get butterflies. Yeah. Because uh, on the back end, then you come out accelerated. Yeah. Um, when you are in an adversarial system like here in California, you cannot re you cannot legally represent two sides. Okay. So th there's a few occasions where I'll have people who come in and it seems like they've agreed on everything mm -hmm. and they just need to get the paperwork right. So in that case, I serve as a mediator, but both of them understand clearly that I represent neither one of them. Mm -hmm. And if anything goes south in that negotiation or agreement, I'm out. Mm -hmm. I cannot represent either one of them because mm -hmm. at that point, both of them would have shared confidential information with me. And therefore, I can represent that if mom's told me some confidential exactly. information and vice versa. So sure. I am conflicted out. Mm -hmm. And then what do you feel like people who, who are going down that road and thinking they don't need to involve a lawyer where they think, okay, Maybe they don't own property. Maybe there's no, you know, no money, no kids, and they say, "Hey, we're just going to get divorced." Do you still think they still need to be going to some type of mediation, a meeting with some type of lawyer, just to make sure that you know maybe two, three, four down years down the road, someone doesn't try to come back and say, "Hey, like I want that now." Yeah, I think at the very least, it's it's advisable, especially when you have more property issues, mm -hmm. right? If you have a full agreement on issues of custody and support. Those matters tend to be pretty straightforward and um, parties without attorneys are more than capable of handling that. And they're also capable of handling more complex uh, issues. However, if you are dividing multiple assets, um, multiple homes or multiple businesses, and even if you're doing that by agreement, it behooves you to have an attorney independently look at an agreement that you're contemplating signing. So it's not necessarily that I'm telling you, no, get an attorney and then negotiate. Mm -hmm. Is if you have a good working relationship with your ex-spouse and you trust one another, you can do it all on your own. But I think I would advise you that once these agreements have been reduced to writing, you take your time and you go and consult with an attorney just to uh, get an idea of whether what you're doing is fair under the law mm -hmm. it is what you would be entitled to and whether what you think you're agreeing to is reflected in the writing mm -hmm. and then do you feel like obviously I li i've lived in california my whole life and i'm starting to get into the age where people are going into family court and happen to be solved and divorces and stuff like that and you know the the uh what people think is that a man in california always gets screwed in a divorce is that like actually true or is that just you know what people have been told their whole lives i really think i have this i have quite an issue with this with my clients and quite an issue in that i have to spend some time explaining it mm -hmm. um no that that's that's not the answer the code the family code treats both parents as parents mm -hmm. it doesn't differentiate between mom and dad um what happens, what happens is that up, up until now, at least, the man tends to make more money than the woman, though that is disappearing faster sure. and faster. I'm and looking for one that makes more money than me as quick as possible. I haven't found one yet, but not, the moment I do... Not a bad idea. Yeah, I'm not a bad idea. getting after that. In, in that case, if you were to get a divorce, then you would think that it would be Perfect. made against women or, or, yeah. the, or, your, or your future ex-wife would yeah. think that. Um, but... What happens is that a lot of times if the man makes more money or they haven't been the main provider mm -hmm. for childcare and, and taking care of the children, they end up having less custody time and paying support mm -hmm. and therefore they feel like the system's out to get them. Mm -hmm. um, part of my job is fully explaining mm -hmm. these concepts of custody, explaining how support gets calculated. Um, hopefully, with the you know, hopefully with the goal that you come out not thinking mm -hmm. that the system's rigged against you. Mm -hmm. And then everyone always talks about the the ten year barrier. Like you've been married over ten years or been together for more ten years. Is that an actual law or is that just like like before men think they're going? You know that that creates also a lot of confusion. That the ten year issue applies in a very narrow con in a very narrow area of family law, which is spousal support. Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with division of assets, mm -hmm. with properties, with children, or with child support. And all it really says is that. Any marriage that's been at least 10 years of or longer is by definition a long marriage. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you as the payor of spousal support will be paying spousal support potentially forever. Forever meaning till retirement. Okay. Um, if the marriage is less than 10 years, then it is 
presume that it's a short-term marriage and therefore the duration for which you pay spousal support is half the duration of the marriage. Okay. Okay. Now, when you get to that 10-year mark, it's, it's a bit of a gray area because if you've been married for nine and a half years as opposed to 10 and a half years, why would one be forever and the other one only half? Yeah. So, you have diff- so then the attorney and understanding those nuances come into play. Mm-hmm. But the 10-year rule is very pervasive in my practice because people think that it applies to a broader thing. It's like, you don't get half of my property unless we were married Mm -hmm. 10 years or you don't have a right to child support unless we were married. Mm -hmm. No, it just only applies to spousal support and it is only a guidance saying that it is presumed to be long-term if it's over Mm -hmm. 10 years, presumed to be short-term if it's less than 10 years. And 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 let me just tell you one more thing. It it doesn't affect the amount of spousal support. Just how long? The duration. The yeah. amount then is driven by other factors. Okay. And then do you do you then and do you see a lot of people when they start getting to that ten year mark, then they're like, you know, if they've been on the work or, or they're like, oh, I gotta get to ten year. Like, I'm gonna hang on a little bit longer, or I'm not gonna hang on. It it happens. Yeah. It happens. And yes. then does that count like towards like if you're legally separated? Does that count like say you're legally separated and then you go over ten years? Does that count before or? So, so your marriage is not the, the the duration of your marriage is not dictated by necessarily when you file for divorce. Mm-hmm. Is when you got married, which is pretty straightforward. Yeah. There is a marriage certificate, and when you separated, okay. right? And separated is when you stop being a couple, mm-hmm. right? More often than not, it's because one party is moving out of the house, mm-hmm. right, or the family residence. Yeah. Other times, because of finances, they stop acting like a couple, right? Mm-hmm. They stop sharing a room. They, they segregate their, their accounts. Mm-hmm. It's, a question, it's what we call a question of fact. Got it. Such that maybe you can be filing for divorce in 2018, mm-hmm. but you've been separated since 2014 because that's when you stopped living together. Yeah, and that, yeah. that happens all the time. And you got married back in 2001. So that's a 13-year marriage, even though you're not filing for divorce until 2018, got which it. would be 17 years after the marriage. Got it. Man, I'm learning so much today. I, mean, I, I hope you know, like this is, we do a lot of podcasts, but this one's actually like super interesting to me. And because it's a lot of things that you hear all these things, but when you actually sit down with someone, you just don't know. Like, you know, and I'm not married, so I've never had to cross this bridge. But right. my sister's going to divorce and just hearing these conversations, like, oh, actually, I actually have a question for her. Like, I'm going to ask this question. Um, if you're going through a divorce and you get an inheritance out of a trust, does that does your spouse have access to that through the divorce okay so remember everything in the law is nuance for sure but the law says that any gift and an inheritance is a gift Mm -hmm. is separate property regardless of when you receive it right so either before during or after the marriage is yours but there's always caveats right Mm -hmm. so if he did anything to or in this case your sister if she did anything to indicate that she have the term we use is that she gifted it to the community, Mm -hmm. then he may have access to it. it. Okay. So how would that be done? There's different ways that that can be done. Mm -hmm. Um, Maybe you want to discuss that. No, for sure. No, I like that. Uh, Off yeah, the record, yeah, or <laughs> no, because no, uh, I mean, my my everyone knows my life. My grandfather passed away and is living. My sister in inherits. She's already going, getting separated. She's in court, and then that was our debate. Like, do if this is transferred because we're going to do it in the next few weeks. If this is transferred to her. And then can he come back and get it? But they've already been separated for like years. Yeah. So remember, it's a gift. So even yeah. if even if it was during the marriage, it yeah. would be hers. The, the, what I meant saying is, for example, let's say they were married. She gets the inheritance and she puts it into a joint account yeah. that they use for the monthly expenses. Mm-hmm. Then that can be presumed to be a gift. Okay. In this case, in this case, based on what you're telling me right now, it seems to be clearly separate property. Perfect. Awesome. Okay. So what do you think that the advice, you know, because obviously everyone doesn't know what the first step is. You know, you're going through and all of a sudden now you're hit with, okay, like, what do I do? I'm, I'm in a situation where I, do I reach out to a lawyer or do I not? Do we try to make it up ourselves? Do you, do you think just sitting down with someone when you're just not sure is the first step to do and then to kind of get your bearings together um, and then start making decisions? I, yeah, I think, uh, I think spending an hour or so with an attorney at the outset is, is very helpful. Okay, and um, I think so because one is not terribly expensive to do a consultation. Many, many attorneys will do free first time consultations and other ones will charge you a consultation fee that is well worth it. Mm -hmm. And 
that and, and the way that I frame those kind of consultations is I, I don't try to push the idea that you need me. I really try to inform you as much as I can. And many people have a go at it themselves. They can, they're, they're, they're smart with forms. It's just a yeah. lot of forms. Yeah. And they can perfectly do it on their own. But I think it gives you a good parameter of what will come to spend that time with a lawyer. Because, for example, the forms or a lot of the reading that you will, that you will do will not explain the difference of the 10-year rule that exactly. we just discussed. Mm -hmm. And you can wrap your head around that 10-year rule and put it around everything else you're doing in your divorce and it turns out it doesn't apply, mm -hmm. right? Or you might think that because your name is not on title of a certain property, you don't have any rights or interest in that property, mm -hmm. which is also incorrect, mm -hmm. okay? Um, so. It's, it's always, I think, beneficial to speak with an attorney, especially at the outset, okay? Mm -hmm. And then I think more often than not, you should have an attorney. Yeah. But I also want to be clear that this proceedings in California and the way that California has set it up, it's, it's done so that people can represent themselves. And, and even as an attorney who might be turning business away from themselves, uh, it's, it's something that a lot of people can do, okay? Yeah. Uh, now... Um, I think you're better off with an attorney more often than not, but not necessarily all the time. Mm -hmm. I think uh, it's funny. We actually had a, my brother came in today and he was, he was talking about uh, one of our clients going into a new build and they're like, Oh, you don't need to bring an agent. We have a new build, blah, blah. And I was like, and it's funny. They we're having this podcast. Today, I said, call your client back and say, would you, if you were getting divorced, would you want one lawyer handling both sides? No, of course you wouldn't. So why would you want to do that in a real estate transaction? You need someone to be looking out for your best interest and to be able to explain to you how exactly things work because sometimes because you don't know how things work and you, it's the same thing. You have tons of forms, but you have no idea what those forms mean. And you can read them a million times, or they mean one way and then they mean another thing. Exactly. So, um, but thank you so much. I learned so much today this is one of my favorite podcasts i've ever done I'm not gonna lie so appreciate it. shout out to you man um so why don't you say on here like how's the best way to people get hold of you how's the best way to people find more about it, you reviews and um and anything like that sure um best way to get a hold of me is you can look me up my name is uh, matias flores law firm is the name of my firm uh, you can reach me over the phone 562-372-0846 you can find me on uh, Facebook uh, under Matias Flores Law Firm. You can find me under Instagram in a bit of a more of a nickname. It's uh, Matutors um, on, uh, on Instagram. Okay. And uh, there's Yelp reviews. There's Google reviews under Matias Flores Law Firm. Awesome, man. Thank you so much for taking the time. And remember, guys, until next time, peace.